so uh, let, let, let's go so, somehow. Uh, what I'm going to talk uh, about in this lecture is uh, performance evaluation. Uh, the, the reason uh, I want to talk about this is because it's quite often uh, underestimated uh, and I find it to be at the heart of epistemological uh, issues whenever we have any kind of automation. Uh, so, so somehow uh, our ambition is to automate uh, and, uh, the humanities and maybe bring big data uh, into them somehow. M machine learning, uh, which is known to the broader public by the buzzword AI, uh, it dominates, uh, uh, dominates uh, this field because somehow uh, it seems to be practically the only way we can really um, uh, work with corpora we don't understand. Now, somehow it's almost magical and that very, very quickly, the moment we begin to use it, makes us feel a bit like wizards, right? Um, so, I, I personally believe that we are only apprentices, right? Uh, I think that the Fantasia story with Mickey is, is quite, quite precise on exactly what happens to a practitioner who uses blindly uh, systems they don't understand. Um, so, so, sometimes com confusion is obvious, right? Uh, and, and this uh, specific question uh, was asked twice from members of the British Parliament on the first engineer to ever design uh, computer hardware. Right. Uh, his name was Babbage. Uh, most of you should know his student, uh, Ada, who was the first programmer ever. Uh, he gave her the specifications and more or less she started coding. And even if the machine never worked, her software did. Uh, so somehow software existed before hardware and that's, that's an interesting thing to remember. Uh, anyway, so he was asking for funding again and again from the British Parliament and they asked him, twice. Uh, excuse me, uh, sir, if we put in the wrong numbers, will the right numbers come out? Right? His machine was supposed to be computing uh, trigonometric maps in order to go, uh, in order to, to use uh, uh, f for navigation. Uh, and, uh, and until then that was done by hand and it was extremely laborious and there were many mistakes. And a mistake on a trigonometric map for a boat that navigates might mean killing the crowd, the, ki killing the, the crew. Uh, right, he, his answer was, I'm not able <laughs> rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question. Uh, yet, in the machine learning paradigm, this becomes uh, much more uh, important. People are much more confused in that direction. We, we must never forget that the machine do does exactly what we tell it and how you formulate the question is practically the answer, right? We, we might think that a program is essentially formulating a question. Uh, so attention really matters, uh, detail really matters. The, the, the pro until now, the, the standard paradigm is that we have uh, engineering practitioners uh, who do their own research and develop systems and models. Uh, that can tackle problems. And then we have uh, domain experts uh, who are more or less, in this case, the humanists. Uh, and from an engineer's uh, perspective, right, we, we, we analyze machine learning, right, but everything else than machine learning we consider an externality. We take it as uh, absolute truth and that's it. We don't judge it, we don't question it, right. So what we care about is, does it work? Does it overfit? That's quantifiably defined by the data. Is it reliable? Uh, but uh, somehow all the externalities for us are the three wizards that brought us gifts. And that's it. Um, at the same time, right, a humanist or any domain expert for, for that matter, it could be a biologist, for example, uh, somehow 
considers machine learning an externality. They, they, they consider that whatever machine learning brings them, it, either it suits them or it doesn't, and that's it. Uh, they, they care about the metadata, right? They care about the data and the metadata, uh, and that's all they, they look into. Um, so somehow we get, I trust the machine learning method, kind of blindly. We can see how ChatGPT within six months is being used by everyone, and as far as I understand, very little criticism has come into how can it be wrong. I've seen a lot of people being, uh, let's say, distrustful from the point of view of is it fair or is it biased or things like that, like ethical questions. But the actual technical thing, can that thing tell me a lie, right? How can this thing uh, lead me to the wrong conclusion? That's not really something I've seen discussed by people who use it. Um, so, so somehow, uh, scholars, they work with data, they understand the data, uh, they try to, to express nuance about it, and that's a whole domain of, of trouble, because somehow machine learning can handle nu nuanced data when the nuance is quanti quantitative, when it can make quantities out of nuance. Uh, and, and that is an extremely hard challenge. Uh, and, uh, and machine learning is, as far as I know, the wizards bringing gifts to a practitioner. There's also the small exception, like Daniel uh, earlier, who says, you know what, if I, if I cannot hear an argument on why a machine thinks something, I just don't trust it. Experiments don't mean much to me. I just don't trust it if it cannot argue why. Uh, and, and the thing is that this age of innocence where we could externalize everything other than our very specific domain in which we know very well what's, what's happening uh, is kind of vanishing, right? Interdisciplinary uh, studies uh, could be two things, right? It could be either joining our ignorance or joining our knowledge. Uh, and somehow I, I find that to be the real challenge, right? So, so the moment you go interdisciplinary, nothing can be more or less uh, be, be left in the middle. Nothing can be an externality. Uh, a team that is interdisciplinary should be able to sign off and have the responsibility of whatever is stated from one end to the other, right? There's another flavor of interdisciplinarity I've seen, which somehow means that we can talk creatively about numbers or we can be very precise about nuances, uh, somehow the, the worst of both worlds. Um, but in our case, we consider that this raises the ante. And our goal uh, in interdisciplinary uh, studies is to somehow make sure that a team consisting of both domains uh, has, uh, can, can responsibly sign off the whole methodology and not just parts of it. Uh, so the, the fundamental problem we have is that machine learning will give you whatever you ask it to. Uh, and uh, just by repeating experiments, uh, you're actually asking something. It's a bit like interrogating, right? And, and there is a saying, uh, I think in the 50s already, when machine learning was done with paper uh, on a board or chalk, whatever, before it was used on computers, there was already a statistician who, who said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to everything. Uh, and in my opinion, that should be every, everyone's mantra whenever they use uh, quantitative data. Uh, now, the challenge coming from that is that every time we use data, somehow it's, it loses a bit of its innocence. It loses a bit of its way to surprise us. And that's why we should have very strict protocols for who gets to see what, how many times, right? How many tries you get is quite important, right? If you ask the same question a thousand times, you will get eventually what you're looking for. And if you're a humanist, it's quite possible you have a theory on what you want to hear, 
and 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 you you have a horse running. Um, so so that is the the biggest danger uh, epistemologically I see with distant reading, right? Um, now. How can we defend against this problem, right? Because it's a bit of chicken and egg. We have the machine learning system, we have the ground truth, and then we have the outcome of the machine learning system. So, so, so the first thing is that, indeed, a machine will look at metadata and produce metadata. But this should never go back, right? So, so the, the most fundamental thing methodologically is that somehow we should never blend the, uh, what machines uh, think, or the opinion of machines, with the opinion or knowledge of humans. Uh, they're totally different things. Uh, and if we have this loop, since a machine can do it in milliseconds and a human can do it in years, right? it will end up diluting human knowledge and having the machine dominate. So this loop must always be controlled. And that's not something that happens in the open domain. In the open domain at the moment, right, automatic text is being generated and we don't know what is what. Right? When Google starts parsing the, the web to scan to make the new large language models, right, they don't discriminate between automatic and not automatic text. Right? So human knowledge is diluted to being less and less. And that has serious repercussions. So uh, so, so what we should do from the point of view of uh, machine learning is the moment we define a corpus on which we're going to work on, right? We must separate train data and test data, right? And test data becomes the thing that we'll, we will use to overwatch the whole process to know how wrong can we be. Ideally, the test data should only be used once. That's not realistic, that's an absolute standard, right? It's an ideal. But every time we use the test data, it becomes less reliable to demonstrate biases we have, right? So the first thing we do is that we train the model, we separate to train and test, and then this loop, we could maybe do more than once, right? Like this thing here, we can try out maybe 10, 10 times, but not a hundred, right? What is right, what is wrong is not absolute. Uh, so the only solution uh, we can have is actually uh, transparency. Uh, if we're transparent about how much we tried things, people can infer, uh, can take something with a grain of salt. If we said, you know what, we tried a hundred times and it worked after a hundred times, uh, it's easier to understand what are the chances that this is a coincidence? The other thing is that if we want to be absolute in this, we have to make sure that this system here never saw the test data directly or indirectly. Right? So one of the biggest problems we might have is that if we make an experiment to train uh, for object classification, right? the standard ImageNet, quite often in machine learning, we have methods that somehow uh, take a general method and specialize it with some extra data. Uh, if the test data was seen on the general method and then when we specialize it, it's not seen, it might still remember it. Uh, that is a, a real danger that is not so, uh, so obscure. So somehow if we take a, a model someone else has tra trained, uh, if we don't have a chain of custody on what information was given to that model, we're always in this danger. Uh, once more, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it because we cannot, but we should be very transparent and very open to communicating what did we take, what we, did we not take. Um, the, the, the last uh, thing which is uh, fundamental experimentally is that we need to, to commit to how we're going to measure things before we start measuring. If, if we don't do that, then somehow our emotions uh, play too much into it, right? 
usually whenever we're uh, practitioners, we, we want to succeed, whether it's to crack a benchmark and get a good score, whether it is to, uh, to more or less validate a narrative that we're already uh, pushing. Uh, it's very easy to tweak what we consider correct in order to validate uh, our results. So, so the intellectually honest way of doing that is uh, to commit somehow to, to, what is, to how we measure results before we actually see the results. Uh, that is once more a, a soft term. It, it's a nuanced policy. Taken taking to an extreme uh, means that we might never get anything done. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, looking at 10 different ways of measuring and choosing the one that validates our story, it's obviously cherry picking and lying. So there is a spectrum in that. Uh, the, um, the, the most important thing uh, about, uh, about this is that traditions and consensus on on why, how we measure a problem, so that to a great extent, right? Uh, if every time you publish a new method, you invent a new way of testing it, somehow uh, you, more or less, you are decide, you are assessing yourself, and self-assessing is very limited on how well it can work. Um, so, so. Breaking the consensus on how we're measuring things is something that should strongly be avoided. It's much better to take a metric uh, that is already established for a similar problem than to come up with one that would better suit us. Uh, we must always think, whenever we're doing quantitative stuff, we must always think with two hats, right? One hat is the, the person making the hypothesis and the other person uh, which it would mean more or less developing a method. The other hat is the person testing the hypothesis, right? On small scale stuff, the same person does both. On bigger scale stuff, it has to be different persons. That's a different standard of quality, right? Uh, on extremely important things, it should be even that, like there should be not, not even institutional overlap. Uh, there are such competitions for machine learning and, and to a great extent, that might be what was the breakthrough uh, in deep learning. The breakthrough in, in deep learning might have been the fact that there was a, an extremely large scale public benchmark where hundreds of thousands of euros were invested yearly in order to compete between industry leaders. Um, so, Given that, that we're humanists, uh, or that you are humanists, uh, probability is probably something that, is not, that you're not very familiar with. Uh, and, and that's a bit uh, weird, because uh, somehow we always deal with nuance and, and vague outcomes. We always speculate about the future. That's how we strategize, even at the most trivial level. Uh, but probability can very, very quickly become uh, unintuitive uh, and, and foolish, right? So uh, I would define probability as a, a precise estimate on the chances of something occurring that can be theoretically founded. It's, it's just more or less how I would, it's a subjective definition, but somehow uh, it, it has a bit what matters, right? So there is a theoretical justification on why uh, we did that. And it's a specific number. Even if we don't know it, the number is specific, right? Now, what we usually have from machine learning systems, for example, or, or any quantitative method quite often, is what can be interpreted as probability, right? So sometimes we could have a theorem proving that if this quantification at the beginning of our data is precise, and that's a, a major if, then we can have a theorem proving that our conclusion is right or wrong with that margin of error, right? Um, but quite often, we don't even have that theorem, 
right? Even if we have it, it's not really meaningful because the assumptions on quantifying our data uh, are an externality that more or less uh, should not be external. Uh, so more, if a variable is between 0 and 1, we can think of it as a probability. We can treat it as a probability. Uh, any machine learning model that has a, a sigmoid function on its output, squashing values between 0 and 1, suddenly can give us probabilities if we want to treat them as such. Right? Uh, but real probability from the point of view of, of proof, that's very rarely what we get. Practically never. So, yes, in this framework, we, we have to think of, uh, if we want to speak in mathematical terms, we have to think of our data and their quantification as an axiom, right? Uh, in, in high school math, more or less, we were taught, I'm not sure how every country does it, that people can define axioms, uh, and then on top of them you define theorems, uh, and uh, the, the less axioms you, you use to come to your conclusions, the better, right? So when our axioms are terabytes of data, and somehow the, the idea that this represents a real phenomenon, these are huge axioms, right? They're, they're extremely far away from the, 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 the 10 axioms in geometry, for example. Uh, and, and we should keep that in mind, right? Because all, all disciplines that in bring math into it, they claim to have the robustness of math. But if you have a terabyte of axioms, right? your math is not as safe as if you have 10 axioms. It's not the same thing. And a major fallacy is that numbers prove things. Right? Numbers prove things if what you put in is proven. What you put in is never proven. Uh, so I would like to now more or less discuss a bit how probabilities can fool us with, with once more a very, very simple uh, example. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, there, there's a TV game. Uh, I, I'm not sure how it's called in Germany. Some, someone told me in German television there was a name for it. Um, the, the game was, was more or less based on simply exploiting uh, perceptual, let's say, a, a, a bias humans have, right? So you have three, uh, three curtains, uh, one of them has a prize, and the other two have null, have nothing, right? I, usually something that mocks you. Uh, and and the, the question is always this. The, the participant to the game uh, would be asked to choose randomly one of the curtains. Uh, and, uh, and then, somehow, they would spend a bit of time hyping a bit the situation, no contact whatsoever related to the game. Uh, and then, more or less, uh, after the, the, the winning, who's the winner was anonymized and people chose. Um, uh, someone would make a guess, let's say it's A, whether it's B or C, it's exactly the same thing. Right? Um, and, and then the host would reveal out of the other two, the ones that weren't chosen, one that was losing, one that was none. And they would ask the question, do you want to switch or do you want to keep your choice? Uh, and, and always the decision would be, uh, well, not always, but quite often, more often than not, the decision would be, I want to keep my choice, right? And and the thing is that when faced with this dilemma, right, you should 
you should know that somehow A, B, and C, right, they each have one third of the probability. Uh, and then, that was before we chose. At the moment we chose, right, we know that B and C, after we commit to A, B and C can be jointly considered to have two thirds of the probability of winning. Right? And then, if this is revealed to us, then we learn that this has zero. And that means that this one inherits two thirds. Right? And that's why, from a point of view of strategy, if you're playing, let's say, uh, as a machine or against a machine, uh, if there's no cheating, if the thing is random, uh, the answer is that you must always choose. Uh, you must always switch. Right? Uh, now, why, why did people uh, got fooled by that? And I'm not sure in this class, in the previous class, I, I, I made a show of hands. I think less than half uh, said they would uh, switch. Uh, why are we fooled? Ma the, the, the best interpretation I have for it is that we have the moral rule of consistency, right? And they conflate morals with numbers, right? One thing is that numbers should have no ethics, no ideology, no nothing. Uh, character doesn't matter to numbers. Uh, very, very few things matter to numbers. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, about this is that uh, somehow this happens all the time when we do when we do quantitative stuff. That's why not knowing the math at all, in my opinion, means that we're not safe to be using it. Right? Uh, this is high school math, uh, and I'm not saying that everyone should know algebra and calculus and whatever, but but. Math can never be taken out of the equation. Math can never be considered a total externality, right? This problem here is, is not advanced math. Uh, actually, professors also got it wrong. Uh, and even from the sciences, even from the exact sciences, professors get it wrong. It's somehow we as humans are not good to deal with it. The other, the other thing that this demonstrates is that when we talk about probabilities uh, and when we talk about experiments, it's not exactly uh, an, ob an objective situation uh, across time. Somehow, when you know what you know is quite important. And, and that's exactly why when you have an experimental procedure, the order in which you do things really matters. Uh, in our analogy, for example, if you first pre-process your data and then you separate to train and test, you have cheated, right? Because you should not have known what is the, the, the what, what are the data specific things in your test set. Um, going a bit more into that, right? Uh, what, what, I, what I believe a, a humanist would always need if they want to do and a distant method is understand how well a distant method or a machine learning system is performing. Uh, and, and somehow, what I've observed quite often is that people care more about the number than what the number is. Right? One might say, for example, as I've seen discussions evolving with uh, experts from other domains, if I say I get 90% accuracy, or 80% MAP, somehow the 90% accuracy sounds better, right? Uh, but what is characterizing the accuracy, and it might have to do with the whole experimental procedure, matters way more. It's very easy to take any experimental threshold and tweak your procedure so that a number comes out at 99 or 95 or whatever. Uh, the easiest cheating way would be to put filters in your data. That would be obvious cheating. But there's other ways that are more subtle 
where you can tweak uh, the system to give you any performance you want. So somehow understanding how we measure things is quite fundamental. And the math is not that complicated, right? Uh, but understanding how we measure a system, to me, is quite important if we want to use it to come to conclusions. Uh, we, will, we will talk a bit about the binary classification uh, example. It's the simplest one of all, right? We have a machine. It looks at, uh, at data, whether they're images or text, doesn't matter. It looks at data and it comes out with, uh, with a choice, like recto verso or whatever, right? Uh, what we need to keep in mind is that there's always the notion of ground truth, which is what the domain expert established. Uh, as we said before, ideally before we start, not after, right? Somehow, uh, ideally in an experimental pipeline, uh, a domain expert, it might be us, right? Committed first to what is right and what is wrong. And then we begin to work on our data. We separate the data into train and test. And then we try to see how can we make our train model, uh, our train outcome improve. And when we're happy with it, we test it once. Okay. Uh, just for, for uh, let's say, for terminology, sometimes there's a validation set. If, if we want to make choices after the fact, and we do it with a test set, we're cheating. It's cherry picking. If we need to make choices after the fact, what we need is a validation test. Uh, if we don't know exactly how to train it, if, if we don't know, should we be using uh, this method or that method, we need an intermediary validation set that will uh, inform us on, on, on this deciding our methodology. And at the end, we'll have a test set to test um, our quality. So uh, at the heart of uh, a binary classification problem, right? we have this matrix here. So we have the ground truth. It's what the scholar gave us. We have the predictions. That's what a machine that to us is a black box uh, is predicting. Uh, and then we have, for example, 100 positive samples, uh, and let's say 100 negative. Let's say we made it balanced. That's, uh, and we have predictions. Some were predicted positive, some negative. Then we have the first thing we have is how many were correct versus how many we had in total. Right? That would be accuracy. Right? So accuracy is already the simplest metric to understand, and if only one number can characterize a method, this might be it quite often. There are cases where it isn't uh, the most informative one, but if we have to choose one number for a classifier, this would be it. And, and the real question is, is 90% good or bad? Right. So, Another question that comes into it right, is uh, the distribution of the data. As we said now, if the data is balanced, it's convenient. 90% on balanced data is a good outcome, right? For, for example, recto verso. But for forgeries, it's not, right? So as we can see, in unbalanced right, uh, data, we might have 36 forgeries in 1,000 documents. 90% would mean practically just getting a few of them or even, or even none of them, right? Uh, so, so somehow, whenever we, we think of performance evaluation uh, and how a model behaves, we should always think of some baselines. And baselines is what do we compare to to contextualize the metric? A metric, a performance metric without a baseline means nothing, right? 90% on its own means nothing. We always need to say 90% versus 50% when, when we flip a coin, right? My classifier got 90%, but if he was flipping a coin, he would be getting 50%. That, that gives context, 
Okay, so uh, that's the one thing, right? The random predictor is always a meaningful baseline. We must always be able to understand what would a random predictor get as a performance to decide how informative it is. Uh, and there is also another uh, standard baseline, which is somehow if someone was smart, looked at the data and decided what's the best strategy to make decisions ignoring the specific datum, right? So look at the whole corpus and say, this is how I would maximize my score. Uh, that one must also be in context. Uh, and, and, and practically, any method, theoretically, it should be impossible for any machine method to go beneath those two things, right? So this somehow should be the, the, the absolute minimum of performance. Literally, zero performance essentially is what these two establish, right? But for example, in the case of forgery detection, the best strategy is to say it's always authentic. And that would give you a 96.4 accuracy, right? I think that that on its own is a very simple demonstration of how distant methods can go very wrong very quickly. We might say, oh yeah, everyone was honest. They never forged anything, right? And somehow, more or less 19 out of 20 times, we're right. Uh, Keep in mind that even biologists, when they want to come to a confident conclusion, they will tolerate a 5% error, <laughs> right? So according to the, let's say, the standards of biology as a science, this would mean that we experimentally proved that our method detects forgeries in a very, very naive and silly way. That's why you have to be very critical when you read things. Um, So, so yes, in, in the question, uh, where does 90% accuracy stand? It stands, uh, we're, we're two and a half times worse than, than rectroverso. Uh, so somehow that, uh, sorry, then forgery det detection, right? The, the, the best blind predictor. Somehow, uh, if something is below those, practically don't use it, right? So what we can do is to, to, to develop slightly more informed uh, metrics, right? The first uh, metric that can dis disambiguate this is called recall, right? A a and, and basically, the idea of recall is that not all mistakes are equal, right? So let's say we have in the forgery example case, right? We have two systems, system A with an accuracy of 94% and system B with an accuracy of 95.2%, okay? As we can see, right? Uh, when it detects correctly a forgery, that's 25 samples. When it detects, uh, uh, when it corrects wrongly, uh, a forgery is 49 samples. Uh, 11, it's when it says it's authentic, and 915, when it says that it's original and it's right. right. In this case, we have slightly different numbers, right? So one is more or less exploiting the total data distribution more strategically than the other, right? Uh, somehow this is more reluctant to identify a forgery. Uh, and as we can see in the accuracy, it is way higher. Now, what is recall? Recall is a different metric, right? It says how many were relevant, more or less, positive out of the total data, right? So how many were, uh, sorry, how many were true positives, right? Out of the relevant data, right? So somehow, how many were correct whenever it was indeed a forgery, right? So out of all the data that were indeed forgeries, how many were correct? 
And, and this ratio, uh, in this case, gives us a 69.4% for this method and a 61.1% for this method. So somehow, uh, a method that, if we assume an asymmetry in the data, right, one class is important, the other not so much. It would be the case, uh, I guess, of forgery detection. Recall is more important, right? If, if we're looking into our corpus of uh, medieval manuscripts to, to see forgeries, because they're quite interesting and they're, they're a phenomenon that's very rare, we want to find them, right? We would like to offer to our scholars a short list of possible forgeries for them to verify. Uh, and in that case, the system with the best recall is the one we want. Uh, so there are uh, similarities. Uh, there are different terms in slightly different domains in information retrieval. It could be called the detection rate. Um, and, uh, and the rule of thumb is that we use it when things might not, must not be missed, when things might, must not be forgotten. Uh, So, yeah, another rule of thumb is if the data is to be verified in the future, it's quite safe to use that. If that is just to, to make the labor of someone manually reviewing data, a high recall method is what we want. Um, so we have a, a symmetric metric, which is the kind of the opposite. It's called precision. Right, uh, and, and in that metric, we must always be correct when we identify something. A good example would be uh, graphonomics and, and saying whether that forgery should convict someone. Right? If we go to court uh, and, and, we, and we testify on whether something is a forgery, uh, we should choose always the method with the best precision. Right? That's the one that somehow implements uh, puts a, a greater value to leaving uh, a guilty man uh, out than to putting an innocent man in. Uh, so, so when when we want to see prediction, uh, so, so when we want to see precision, it's essentially the the symmetric. So before we grouped uh, horizontally according to the ground truth, and now we group by the predictions. We still care about the true positives, right? That's more or less the gold nugget we always get. But somehow the context now is different, right? So the context now is detected documents. And, and in this case, this method that somehow uh, is worst adapt, uh, adapted to the global bias, as you can see, it has a worse precision. Uh, while this one that fits the data better has a uh, has a better precision, uh, right? And we can see that somehow recall and precision are you cannot do you cannot do well in both. It's somehow whenever you tweak things, you're you're usually cheating on one or the other direction. You're usually tweaking your model on one or the other direction. Um, so, right, the precision matters whenever we never want to be wrong. That's, that's the take home message. Uh, so if we want to talk, and that to be honest is a bit how uh, engineering experts will communicate a method. So engineering uh, papers that present a method for analysis, they usually try to to put that method out of context, right? Uh, they need a single number so they can say which method is better from an engineering point of view, right? So as I said, we have accuracy, but it can really lead us astray. Uh, but, but there is another method that compares, that, that joins these two numbers into a single one. Uh, this has many names. Uh, it's called uh, the F-score. Uh, and it has this weird formula here. More or less, the denominator is the geometric mean, and the denominator is the arithmetic mean. That's roughly the idea. Uh, and all 
already here, I expect that people who are not trained in math would have a hard time traveling what that means. Why is this thing so cool? But I think that if we, if we look here, we can, we can see a bit the essence of this way of combining things. More or less, uh, it means that uh, as we have methods, uh, if, if we're biased on one or the other direction, we get a, be a worse score right, than if we are somehow balanced. Right? We can see that in this diagonal, like 50-50% gives us a brighter spot than any other version right, of 50%. Um, so, so somehow uh, the F measure uh, is, uh, is, is a good way to say that I want my system to be balanced and, uh, and modest. It's, it's the standard score we use whenever, for, specifically for a, bi uh, for a binary classifier, but in general for classifiers. So, so as we look into this, right, the F score of, of these two ends up being 45.5% right, versus 47.8%. From the point of view of the F score, right, uh, this system is uh, slightly better. And the reason is that somehow looking into the general nature of the data, because this is what the system does, uh, pays off, right? Uh, as we can see, this, in this line here, is more or less where we have accuracy standing. So if we assume perfect symmetry in, in any method, right? Uh, if a method is perfectly symmetrical and not biased on, on being conservative or not for one of the two classes, then we have simply the accuracy line here, right? And more or less 50% on both. Uh, and that's the quickest way to, to ascend this line, right? There is no quicker way to get, to get this shadow. Uh, as you can see, it's further away here than here. The other thing we can see about the F score, and that's something a bit to keep in mind, is that extreme opinions on the lower uh, performances are really strongly penalized. While on the upper scale, we can see that these lines end up being straight, which means that more or less if you're here, it's just uh, the arithmetic average. Uh, sorry. Right. And, and if we put the F-score for naive baselines, and that's a bit of an interesting thing, right? Because uh, if we look a bit into the, the best informed uh, strategy, right? It was getting a 96 accuracy, actually outperforming both of our models. Uh, the best blind predictor in this case gets 0%, right? So this metric already, the simplest way to cheat, which is to look at the corpus and just understand how the corpus is in general, without ever looking at a specific datum, is filtered out. And the other classifier, which has a 50-50% uh, accuracy of being co uh, correct or not, uh, in this case, it falls down to 6.7, right? And that's a bit how, that's a bit interesting because suddenly that, that puts context into these two numbers, right? Suddenly, we know that these two systems are extremely better than both of these naive baselines, right? Um, so, uh, so, so, so the gold nugget in this is that we need a baseline to understand uh, what a number means. Uh, and usually these naive baselines are never published. What we usually publish is other advanced methods. Somehow the whole idea is that we take as a baseline what used to be cool five years ago and we try to outperform that one. Of course, the first time we publish something, right, because this is making a chain, a chain of methods, 
uh, naive baselines must be inside. Otherwise, it means nothing. Now, for multi-class classification, it becomes a bit more complicated, right? Because uh, we can have uh, two approaches, right? We can have a, a bunch of classifiers, each one detecting yes or no for its own class. And then we can have a pure multi-class classifier. Uh, and these two things could be uh, measured uh, differently. Uh, the, the thing is that multiple metrics come out and suddenly how to combine them and how to measure them becomes quite more nuanced. Uh, that practically sh shifts uh, the question to, to, the, to the actual data. The moment we go into more complicated systems and more complicated evaluation procedures, we should have a better understanding of what our data domain is and somehow what metrics reveals what about our data specifically. Right, so, uh, yeah, a trivial uh, multi-class data set, for example, that I worked with uh, was uh, that we had 130 documents in English, 122 in German, 89 documents in Italian, 117 in Russian, and 458 in total, right? And then comes the question, for every sample, right, we have a probability of every language and the ground truth here, right? Uh, so, so one way to measure the outcome is to assume winner takes all right, and, and threshold everything and say whatever was the strongest opinion, that's the only one. Uh, it happens to be that for for the standard machine learning cl classifiers that are now contemporary, uh, they actually turn to do that internally because of how they're trained. Uh, they turn to have a, a mentality of winner takes all. They classifiers things that choose among a specific limited set of options t t tend to be not nuanced at all, right? Um, and in that case, the equivalent the binary matrix we had here, right, ends out being this whole thing, right? So, so this whole thing uh, is what we would call a confusion matrix, uh, as one might have seen in the other lecture, uh, a confusion matrix is how, it's the most transparent way to, to present classification outcome. Uh, and, uh, and somehow, in that case, the accuracy would be the mean of the diagonal, right? So it would be more or less the sum of the diagonal to be exact, ver divided by the sum of the whole matrix. And that's the accuracy. The accuracy, the reason I said it's the simplest and best metric, is that somehow it's always applicable, right? It's applicable in this scenario directly. The, the notion of recall and precision somehow uh, in this case, it is different for every class, but we could see a bit the analogies from the previous stuff on whether we go horizontally or vertically, right? If we contextualize our correct things with what should have been correct, then more or less we get uh, the something associated to recall, and if we do the uh, the horizontal rows then we get something slightly associated to uh, uh, to, uh, to precision, right? So a, a very a very convenient way to to work with a bad method is to reformulate the problem. Uh, qu quite often. We can have something that is performing quite badly, but we can still make something out of it. Uh, and uh, the most uh, simple trick we can do to somehow do evaluation magic to make more out of something that works poorly uh, is, is to, to recast our problem as a, as a ranking one. Uh, that's more or less, it has many different names. Retrieval would be one of them. 
Another one would be uh, zero shot learning, right? Uh, but somehow, uh, when we want to score rankings, it means uh, that we're much more tolerant to wrong things, uh, right? So, if we want to talk about rankings, usually the scenario is that we have something rare in a big corpus of, of, of irrelevant things. Uh, and so somehow the example would be, uh, let's, let's see a bit, can we how, how right can we be when we are looking for the English things in our corpus, right? Uh, rank, so if we reformulate the problem to rank my corpus uh, by, by probability of being English, uh, that's, that's an easy way to get something out of, of, of a bad system, right? So, uh, f f the formula, the, 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 the algorithm with which we would count that would be that as we, we rank the sorted corpus, uh, and then we look at a given at the top n, whether that's 10 or 100 or 500, and on that top 10, we measure the recall and the precision. Uh, one thing being uh, that precision, of course, if there are not enough uh, English samples, right? If we have only 100 samples and n is 200, obviously the precision of English can never be 100%. Even the best system would not have that. So we need to rectify that a bit and compare the precision to the best, like 100% should be the best achievable one. Okay, so, so when we're tweaking uh, the problem in order to get out useful things, uh, a very simple question is, for example, uh, uh, how many hypotheses are valid, right? And, and when we're looking for, for text in, in such an image, that's a good example where we can be very wrong. Finding actually text can be very wrong because our criterion is that we need to find text and, and, and then say what it is, right? So somehow there comes a question, is, it, is one letter part of text or is the whole word part of text? Uh, there's overlaps. And as we see, depending on how many hypotheses we entertain, we get garbage in, obvious garbage, but we're also certain that we have very well covered the real thing, right? Um, and, and that's a bit when our metrics are no longer numbers, right? So m more or less, uh, if, we, if we say, how big is n gonna be, right? We rank all our hypotheses by, by n. There comes a curve on how many things are we missing when we open the door bigger and bigger to let hypotheses come in? Um, and what is interesting in this, uh, in this drawing is that this, this comes from a, a real paper we, we co-authored, like I co-authored, done by Dana Bazazian. And, and it's, very, it's very interesting that there is no such thing as a good method. Right? Every curve here is the performance of a different method. There is no good method. It has to do with what you need. Right? So we can see that there are methods that are more conservative at the beginning, methods that are more conservative at the end. Right? There are methods that essentially in the end, for example, become top. But that's never meaningful. Right? It means that somehow if I keep in half of the hypothesis, I'm going to be okay, right? They can more or less just reject a few hypotheses. That's not really useful, right? Keep, keep in mind that this scale is logarithmic, right? So we have here is for 10 samples, here is for 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. Uh, yeah, that 
should be uh, a million or something, right? So, so if we look at this curve, right, uh, this this one here can argue that you know what? If we have infinite computational resources and we're willing to entertain a lot of hypotheses, I'm the best. More or less, anyone who at any point uh, is uh, overperforming is the method to be using. Uh, the, 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 the cheat in this is that somehow, uh, without verification, there's no real point in being here, right? You're going to be correct, like if you're looking for, I don't know, 50 or 100 samples, you're going to be correct one, one percent, you're going to have a 1% percent precision or something, right? Uh, while here, you're way, way better. Um, so, yeah, understanding a bit these curves is quite challenging, but sometimes if, if you're willing to spend a few months, right, on, on getting a decent reading method, you're very well advised to spend one or two weeks in understanding how well they work and how well they fit your data and in which one uh, is suitable for your use case, right? So as we can see here, that's a different uh, way of, 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 of showing, it's a different curve. So in the previous curve, we had more or less how many things we're willing to entertain. In this curve here, we have a different question. We have, uh, we can have a threshold on, on how conservative we're being. And if we integrate all of that uh, threshold, we could plot a curve on what's our precision versus what's our recall, right? So if we say nothing is real, right? Nothing is accepted, nothing is a forgery, right? We would have a precision uh, of 100%, right? If we say everything is a forgery, we would have a recall of 100%. And the quality of our system lies in here. Uh, there is a bit of a question uh, what do we need? And in this case, uh, our use case is more or less an angle on which we want to we want to cross this line, right? If we if we need to be very conservative, we want to look on this region. If we need to be uh, let's say liberal, but not miss stuff, we need to be on this um, sign. Now, when it comes to computer vision, uh, it becomes even more complicated because if we have, for example, textual data, what is a match and what is not is kind of objective, right? Uh, let's say we're looking for a word, we found the word, yes or no? It's kind of objective. Or we might be looking for the stemmed version of the world. Wh whatever we're doing, it's a yes, no uh, on, on the most the small granularity of the data. In the case of, uh, of a thing that looks into an image, a bit like we were doing with the bus, right? There comes a question, uh, when I detect a rectangle and say, this is a rectangle, uh, and I say, that's, that's the text in it, right? I don't, I don't only need to be right on, on what I found, I also need to be right on where I found it. And so there is uh, the notion of uh, IOU, intersection over union. Uh, depending on whether we're talking about rectangles or uh, or free shapes, right? Uh, this has slightly different meanings. But as we can see, if, for example, this was the ground truth and this was our prediction, uh, the IOU is the surface of this divided by the surface of both the rectangles together, right? Uh, and and just understand how you can be a very, very strict uh, criterion. This is what 92% IOU looks like. It's practically perfect match, right? This is what 71% IOU looks like, and this is what 39% IOU looks like. The way computer vision methods work whenever they talk about choosing a region is that they will threshold at IOUs and then do the measurements we talked about before. 
The standard one would be 50%, right? Because somehow, if you're very precise on what you found, uh, it can be no coincidence if you find it slightly to the left or slightly to the right. More or less, you identified the right object, you were just a bit wrong on where it was uh, happening. If you identified it in a totally different place, it might be a coincidence, right? If, if we look uh, into this uh, class and we look for faces, right? Having a small overlap with the face would mean that we have a proper detection. But if somehow we see a face, we detect a face on the wall and nothing else like a face nearby, it's just a hallucination. Um, so so the, 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 the last domain of, let's say, people doing an evaluation is what I call the black arts. And that's a bit... Uh, qualitative analysis, perceptual analysis. Somehow we can, we can draw data and look at the drawing of the data. Uh, so methods can draw data for us in a way that somehow uh, looks meaningful. And then we're supposed to interpret that qualitatively. Uh, and that's extremely dangerous. Uh, somehow uh, this is exactly where you can be misled very much uh, seeing things and literally hallucinating things that are not there. Um, so, so the most standard of these methods uh, would be PCA, right? The, the hypothesis in this is that we have uh, vector descriptions of things. That would be the, the standard scenario, right? So we have 50 numbers describing a sample. Right? And then we could do maybe zero shot or whatever. We want to see how well these 50 numbers describe the data. That, that, that's our question. Uh, and, and what we could do is PCA would be one of them. So extrapolating on multiple dimensions is something that, as far as I've understood, even Nobel laureates are not, they don't do it. As far as I understand, very few people claim to understand before four dimensions perceptually. And even four is a challenge for most people. Uh, so when we talk, because this happens quite often in machine learning for uh, 50 dimensions, we cannot imagine that, don't ever try. It's probably a very big waste of your mental capacities. But there is one thing to keep in mind, a very, very uh, intuitive rule of thumb on, on what happens if I go from two dimensions to 50. And that is that I have way more neighbors. My direct neighbors are way more. We can think that about if we think of pixels versus voxels, right? Cubes versus squares. In a square, my totally direct neighbor, neighbors with which I share a side are four, while in a cube, there's six. And if I take my slightly indirect neighbors, the ones with which I share a corner, right? They would be uh, four in in pixels and eight in voxels. Now think if you do that 50 times instead of just one. So every time you add uh, a dimension, you're just adding more ways to be similar with someone. Uh, that's a bit a different way of talking about what's also known as the curse of dimensionality. When you have high dimensions, everything is near everything. Uh, but in any case, if you always reason with multiple dimensions with two, if you keep in mind that rule, two dimensions is good enough to understand quite some things. So in the case of PCA, right, if we have a, a point cloud of, of variables, right, like let's say this is date uh, and this is frequency, uh, frequency of, the, of a topic uh, in, in, a, in a corpus, right? So every point is a document. Uh, here is uh, how strong is a topic predictor, and here is um, the date of the document, right? We want to see a correlation between things or something like that. What we would actually get that would be realistic data would be something like this. And we would see a trend that as time goes by, uh, a topic becomes more prominent, right? There, there might be a topic if we do topic model analysis that is somehow more prominent with uh, the recent past than the older past. PCA, what it does is that as it takes this thing, it tries to find the best uh, rotation, the best uh, angle in which where I 
if I projected my data, they would be as scattered as possible. Right? And then it, it tries to find that for the next uh, dimension as well. Right? So in the case of two data, uh, there's only one rotation it's looking for. In the case of uh, 3D data, there's three rotations it's looking for. But in any case, what it does is that it will try to uh, project things in such a way that differences are amplified. Uh, it's, it's a linear model. It was developed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 80 years ago or so. It's way before we did anything computational. Uh, but uh, this has, uh, is still one of the main tools in many attempts to do quantific social sciences or economics or things like that. Um, quite often, in many phenomena, we might associate directions with specific attributes of the data. For example, in some biological data, I happened to work at some point, uh, one component, we were measuring uh, gene expressions, uh, uh, and one component ended up being uh, the, the, circa the, the circadian uh, cycle, right? Whether it's eight hours or 10 hours after, after sleep or 20 hours after sleep, another component ended up being uh, the, how much water was in the peripheries, stuff like that. Um, the, the, the other, uh, the other uh, visualization of this sort we can have is TSNE. The difference that TSNE has to PCA would be roughly that PCA is, is linear and it tries to just show you how to twist your data. It doesn't change the data. It just twists the data, rotates the data, so that uh, you can get uh, a ranking of angle by, uh, by explanation. This one here does something totally different. It actually moves data around in such a way that things that should be very near end up being near as often as possible. So somehow, when you look at TSME, it's meant for human it's meant for you to look at this, right? So it's just a subtle cue. The mathematical properties this has uh, don't guarantee any deeper truth than maybe revealing patterns to you, revealing similar things. For sure, uh, it, 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 two things being close uh, is more of a statement than two things being apart, right? So somehow, what this point and this point, the fact that they have this distance is way less important than the fact that this is next to this. That's a bit what uh, uh, TSNE does for us. These, these are fairly recent methods, right? They are about, uh, I think TSNE should be uh, 12 years old or maybe 15 years old, something like that. Um, and, and the other thing is that in this case, if we think a bit about what we're visualizing, the colors, where do the colors come from? That's stuff we know, right? So in this case, what we're actually visualizing is uh, one zero shot learning, right? Uh, it gives us a very rough opinion on, of how well would zero shot learning work for something, uh, right? So we have 50 numbers describing an item. We happened to have to know a category of that item and it will plot to us how well they're grouped together. The, the whole idea being that the, the vector description of the number is something different than what we're plotting. A good example could be, for example, if we do topic modeling, right? Once more, the colors could be the languages, right? If someone wanted to know how well our languages correlated to topic models, we could have the languages being as colors we could maybe have the century, right? Although this wouldn't, wouldn't produce this outcome because it's, it's way more blended. I would expect if we had time, because it's a continuum rather than something distinct. To be. Another thing could be if we were doing uh, author attribution and we had a limited list of authors. Right? This could be topic modeling uh, and every color could be a different author. That's the kind of visualization we could use for this. Um, UMAP came just uh, 
I think, 10 years ago. It's even more recent. And, and, and practically, it's faster. Okay, uh, And it, it puts a bit more emphasis on, on, on the on, on, on things that are apart, right? Somehow TSNE, uh, it, it can put these things here or here. And for TSNE, this would be somehow equivalent. UMAP will say, you know what? As long as I pay attention to the immediate neighbors, I would also like to, to draw the, the further distances. So somehow, uh, if we wanted to ask how different is French from English, right, or every language from every other language, UMAP might be a better way uh, to, to, to look into that than TSC, right, because somehow distances would also matter, like uh, this joint thing. It's also faster, actually. So in general, UMAP is just the most modern thing. Uh, there's very little reason to use TSNE instead of UMAP. Um, but, but there is a bit of, a, of an issue, and that is that um, we took just data sets and plotted them according to these three methods. Right? That, I think that comes from the, TS, uh, from the UMAP paper, where they compare uh, their methods. So they took the raw data, if I'm not mistaken. Like this is MNIST, these are image digits. They just took the raw pixel values, right, and, and threw them into UMAP. UMAP, no matter how many dimensions you throw into it, it will always give you back two. Uh, and in PCA, obviously, no matter how many dimensions you give to it, you will keep the two dominant. That's, that's how you make PCA uh, a 2D projection, right? So it would be interesting to see a bit that just on the raw data, these things can find similarities, right? There is no machine learning. They never corrected anything to do that, right? This is a bit where it, it kind of becomes metaphysical, right? But somehow when you take pixels from an image containing this, the, the digit zero, which is what MNIST would be, and you just group them as numbers. You get actually distinct, very, very distinct clusters, right? Uh, fashion MNIST, uh, it's another very important computer vision benchmark because it has exactly the same cardinalities. It has exactly the same size from any point of view, pixels, samples, classes, but the drawings are much uh, more complicated, right? They're very small drawings of clothes, 28 by 28 pixels, gray level, no color. Um, so that's a bit, and that's why a bit why I call it the black art, right? If you're a bit creative, you can interpret on this until the cows come home, right? You, as you can see, you can see everything in here. That doesn't mean you have something concrete. And I consider that the more creative you are, the more dangerous these things are to lead you astray. To a great extent, whatever you see is your eyes. Your eyes somehow assign meaning to patterns. That's, I think, here a very good indication. Uh, and, and the most absolute uh, demonstration of this for me was that this is actually uh, prime numbers. We take all numbers, I think the first million numbers, and then we say uh, we, we have a one for every divisor of the whole numbers up to that value and a zero for every non-divisor. And that way we turn every number into a vector. We plotted it and this came out. Right? This is literally the first million numbers. Out of, the, out of counting the numbers from one to one million, right? Uh, UMAP produces this, right? So, so that's something to never forget when you're interpreting things like that, right? Somehow, I assume everyone here would say that there's nothing to be discussed about and there's nothing to be seen in all numbers from one to one million. And yet this arises from UMAP, right? That's a bit of danger. It will find it will amplify the most minute difference in a way that is meant to stimulate 
your, your visual perception. Uh, so somehow, while these are very popular to say stories and show nice things and suggest and insinuate very interesting phenomena, uh, it's also a very simple way uh, to write bullshit.